We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Thus begins the United States Constitution. Hey everybody, I'm Charlie and this is my Constitution series, in which I'll be combing through the United States Constitution line by line in order to gain a better understanding of this document that forms the foundation of our national government. Today I'll be covering just one sentence, the preamble. The first few words of the preamble are some of the most famous words in the history of our country. You remember these words, every phrase has meaning. It's not like the Declaration of Independence, which rambles on for the first paragraph before getting to the good parts. If you can recite any part between when in the course of human events and we hold these truths to be self-evident, I would be simultaneously impressed and baffled. The Constitution, on the other hand, doesn't mince words. It makes it immediately clear who's talking and what they're talking about. The Constitution isn't a terribly long document, but it's very dense. Every word said and unsaid speaks volumes. In this series, I intend to go through the Constitution section by section and unpack each one to the best of my ability. I'll be quoting the text directly from the National Archives for accuracy. Understanding our Constitution is a key part of understanding our country. Every word was carefully considered, much like how level 1-1 was the last level created for the original Super Mario Brothers, the preamble was written by Governor Morris after the rest of the Constitution was basically finalized. After all, to introduce you to what the document does, they first needed to hammer out the details of what exactly the document would do, which would have been impossible before the rest of the Constitution existed. The preamble of the Constitution is a single sentence, but an extremely dense one. It had to be. At the time it was written, it wasn't clear that the country would accept this constitution. The document was replacing an existing form of government laid out in the Articles of Confederation, which were finally ratified by all the states a mere six years before the Constitutional Convention ripped it apart and decided to start over. As such, the preamble isn't merely a statement of intent. It's ripping through the failures of its predecessor. The Articles of Confederation gave the national government very narrow rights to tax the states, no ability to raise an army, and no power to enforce its jurisdiction over interstate disputes. The Constitution was intended to fix all of that. I don't intend to spend this entire series going word by word through the entire Constitution, but I need to hammer this point home, so let's break down this preamble. We, the people of the United States, makes it clear that the document was coming into effect through a democratic process. This was not being imposed upon the country by a despot or a small group of people in a smoke-filled room. The people chose this. Compare this to the opening of the Articles of Confederation. We, the undersigned delegates of the states affixed to our names, in short, though the Constitution was written by delegates just as the Articles were, the Constitution allowed the people of the country to take ownership of the document far better than the Articles did. Finally, it's worth mentioning that this opening line was a point of contention for many, as it implied that these United States were no longer individual states. That is, the geopolitical meaning of the word, a self-governing territory like Germany or Spain. Basically what we would now call a nation. The people of the country, its citizens, were now part of a larger country, rather than merely being citizens of their individual states, which happened to be somewhat united. This was seen as an attack on the sovereignty of the states, which was a major hurdle the Federalists needed to overcome. In order to form a more perfect union. More perfect than what? More perfect than the union formed under the Articles of Confederation, of course. Establish justice. The Articles of Confederation granted the national government judicial powers over interstate disputes and naval issues. But in practice, the government had no power to enforce this justice. There was no established judicial branch. It was left to Congress to serve as a court should the need arise, but it was irrelevant since states had no reason to accept their judgments. The Constitution, of course, allowed Congress to establish the much more robust and powerful judicial branch of the federal government. Ensure domestic tranquility. The Articles didn't allow the national government to raise a single national army. Instead, it was left to the states to arm and train their own militias. Giving the states their own little armies may well have led to interstate violence, and the national government wouldn't have been able to do much about it. This wasn't an abstract concern, by the way. 
individual states had in the past strongly considered resorting to violence to settle border disputes. Also, there had been several rebellions in the wake of the Revolutionary War, often involving underpaid soldiers who fought for our independence. Shays' Rebellion was the largest, and it put the country on notice that if we're not careful, we can find ourselves destroyed from the inside. Provide for the common defense. Again, the Articles gave the government practically no ability to raise an army or keep it together, which, in addition to leaving us open to internal threats from rogue state militias, also left us more vulnerable to external dangers. Congress could approve supplies for the army, but it couldn't actually force or pay suppliers to provide those provisions. As a result, the Continental Army throughout the Revolutionary War suffered from a lack of men, desertion, and disobedience. And the soldiers who stuck through it all too often went hungry, thirsty, and cold. Case in point, thousands of American soldiers died of disease, hunger, and exposure at Valley Forge over the course of a single winter. In the end, many of the people who opposed a better funded military turned out to be people who had seen little of the fighting during the revolution and didn't understand the realities of what the soldiers had to endure. Promote the general welfare. With no budget and no power, there was little the government could offer the states or their people. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Because with the Articles of Confederation, the country probably wouldn't outlive the people who fought for its independence. Specifically, both the Constitution and the Articles laid out many guaranteed freedoms for its citizens which were seen as vital to the foundation of a free country, such as the writ of habeas corpus, protections from ex post facto laws, and so on, which we'll discuss in future episodes. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America to replace that other document whose services are just no longer needed. It's true that the Articles of Confederation had a lot of problems. Basically, the best thing the Constitution had going for it, which got it ratified, was at least it's better than the Articles. However, I want to give the Articles their due, since though they would have been an awful basis for a long-term government, they did manage to barely hold the country together through the turbulent Revolutionary War and through the country's infancy. That said, it was important that the Constitution make the case for its existence right there in the first sentence. The Constitution needed to be ratified by nine states to come into effect, and there was organized resistance against it. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists were our nation's first political parties, and their entire purpose was fighting for or against the ratification of the Constitution. The Federalists, the ones who supported the Constitution, won, of course, but it was not a sure thing. Though the intention is lost on most people now, I think the fact that the Constitution justifies its purpose by directly comparing itself to the Articles of Confederation in the first sentence helped it to succeed. Anyway, not every part of this series will spend this much time on a single sentence. Future episodes will cover multiple sections at a time, though there are plenty more dense sentences to come. It's worth exploring each one just to demonstrate how much thought was put into this document. I'll leave you with this excerpt from a speech given by Edmund Randolph, one of the framers of the Constitution who refused to sign the final document, but who ultimately fought in its favor at the ratification convention in Virginia. I therefore conclude that the Confederation is too defective to deserve correction. Let us take farewell of it with reverential respect as an old benefactor. It is gone. Whether this house says so or not, it is gone, sir, by its own weakness. I believe gentlemen are sincere in their opposition and actuated by pure motives. But when I maturely weigh the advantages of the Union and dreadful consequences of its dissolution, when I see safety on my right and destruction on my left, when I behold respectability and happiness acquired by one but annihilated by the other, I cannot hesitate to decide in favor of the former." Notice here how he manages to disagree wholeheartedly with the opposition without becoming disrespectful. And in the end, Edmund Randolph's support was key in getting Virginia to ratify the Constitution, which led directly to ratification in New York. Next time we'll get into the actual meat of the Constitution, with Article 1, the part that creates and defines the powers of the legislature. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.